Good morning, brothers and sisters, and welcome to the last study of this week in the takedown of the USA and Adventism. Before we begin the study, shall we thank our Heavenly Father for his blessings through this week and ask for his continued guidance so that we might have an understanding of that which he would present to us at this time. Shall we pray? Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for all of the blessings that you have been providing. We ask you, Father, for your guidance and your direction. Help us as we open your word, and we look to open the words of your prophet, that we might make sense of things that we are reading. May our minds be open and receptive. May your spirit help us direct us and guide us in all things so that we may more properly glorify your name and give glory to your character. I thank you for those that are in this study today. I thank you for those that will view this study later on the internet. I ask your blessing upon all. Direct us now so that what we read, we might truly understand. Help us to this end. For this, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Now, yesterday, did we finish Article 4? Mm -hmm. We came to a conclusion. Yeah. Okay. So this, this little portion from 1 Samuel 13, verse 21, yet they had a file for the Maddox. That does not mean that the children of Israel had a file. It means that the Philistines had a file. Well, it means that they were charging them for filing. So okay. the idea, there's a word there that should be translated as price. All right. Yeah. So the idea is that they had a price for filing the Maddox and the, all the other implements. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> now, with that being the case, we will then go into this on part five. <clears throat> subtitled Gideon's Men. Now, is this on the screen before you? Yeah. Okay. The paragraph begins, the use of Bible types can help us to see things in a different perspective than we would normally see. In today's world of Adventism, in, certain, in terms of Bible study, I would venture to say that it is through the use of many different translations of the Bible that most people arrive at their conception of Bible truth. Coupled with the various denominational books, television, and other popular ministries, we as a people form our conclusions on the best sounding or the most plausible explanations that seem to agree with the closest to Scripture. In other words, we let others form the conclusions, and we simply pick the one that we think is trustworthy or most suitable. Now, now okay, you have some comments on that? Well, I was I was going to say that this paragraph basically lines out exactly what we just talked about, about having their own file. Having their own file? But what we just talked about from the fourth article. Yeah, well, about the fact that the, the Philistines have the files. But he, he makes the mean. assumption that it's the children of Israel that has their own file. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, what he's saying here is uh, it's partly true. Um, so I think the problem that people have in how they study, because I've spent a lot of time thinking about this, you know, ever since I was quite young, actually, is how people learn, how they draw conclusions. Okay. And, you know, my conclusion is that people generally just believe things that they're told, even if they don't always match other things they believe. That is, we generally don't have a very systematic way of deciding how we even came to the conclusions that we have. So there's lots of different ways in which we draw conclusions. One is they're just, they're not even conclusions, they're just presuppositions, right? They're just Things we're told, we always believe, uh, we never question them. You know, and you could use examples like, uh, you know, how we wash the dishes. Right. 
you know, people can actually be quite emotional about how they wash the dishes, that there is a right way to wash dishes. You know, whether you dry them with a towel or not, whether you let them air dry, you know, do you have the tap running when you rinse them? Do you put them in a dishwasher instead of washing them by hand? You know, so there's lots of things like that in in all areas of our life, right? That we never question. And that if somebody does it differently, we, we actually just think they're wrong, right? So right. all these little values and and preferences and ideas. Now that also, you know, applies to how we understand the Bible, you know, how we're brought up um, when it comes to uh, the scriptures. And uh, so, you know, there's, there's, when we, when we listen to sermons, we just kind of, oh, that kind of sounds good. It fits in with what I already understand. There isn't a lot of critical thinking, generally speaking, that goes into how we form our belief systems. That's my, that's my experience with, you know, dealing with other people and, and myself as well. I mean, we all recognize that there's things that we just accept. And we never really question. And often they don't fit together. So, I mean, what he's describing is, is sort of, it's, it's part of the truth of, of things and how we arrive at our conception of Bible truth. Now, uh, he talks about this use of Bible translations, which he's going to talk about later in, in the article. I don't really think that has a lot to do with it, but uh, we'll discuss that when we get later on. Okay. In mention of the popular ministries, they sometimes remind me of the high-profile basketball player who a few years back went to North Korea to negotiate the release of an American hostage. While he was recognized as an exceptionally gifted pro basketball player, those skills did not necessarily qualify him to be a high-stakes negotiator representing the most powerful nation in the world. You see this with other high-profile personalities in the sports, media, and business sectors who somehow come to believe that they're qualified by their success to engage in a realm in which they are actually just as highly unqualified to accomplish. Money and power can provide the platform, but it cannot provide the wisdom, experience, or knowledge. The point to make is that while these ministries can do a good work in their respective fields, they should not be permitted to take the place of our own personal study of the scriptures or be relied upon as our main expositor of the scriptures. So I would think his example actually doesn't fit with what he concludes. It doesn't fit whatsoever. Because <laughs> that argument that he makes in the paragraph above would usually be an example of how you get a specialist <laughs> to be right. the one who decides what is truth, right? So it's, it's almost the opposite of what he concludes. Does that make sense? Well, in this particular situation, mm -hmm. the the entire example is a good, well, the, the entire portion of this is a good example of non sequitur. It just yeah. does not track. Yeah. Now, so, of course, we believe, so, so I wouldn't even have used that example. I mean, what we need to recognize is that you know, God speaks to each of us individually. And while, you know, the world thinks that that theology is just for the expert, right? I mean, that's, we, we run into that in Adventism all the time. You know, we need to go to the theologians. We got to decide, you know, what does the BRI say about the 2520, right? So, you know, which to me is, is kind of irrelevant. Um, now, I'm not sure... Um, What's the guy's name? Dennis Rodman. Uh, right. Was he successful in actually getting an American hostage release? I believe he was. So, so that would be a bad example then, right? 
And, right. and plus, he actually, you know, the reason why he was successful, I would think, is because, you know, the whatever his name is, Kim or something, is, um, you know, a fan of Dennis Rodman. Correct. I mean, so, so he was actually in probably a better position than a lot of people to negotiate the release of the hostage. You know, if I remember correctly about that story, that was a long time ago. But. Yeah, it was 2013. Yeah. But yeah, so I'm not really sure where, why he brought up that example and how that relates. Um, because when it comes to the qualifications that we need for ourselves, the reality is no one can do for us what we have to do for ourselves. That is, no one can study God's word for us. Now, it is important to listen to others who have studied, right? That's part of study. I mean, um, you know, I've, I've run into people who just say, well, I'm just going to study the Bible without, you know, anyone else. And that's, you know, God says that we should not forsake the assembling of ourselves together, right? There's a point to come together um, to study, right? Where two or three are gathered together. There I am in the midst. And then, of course, we have these people, and I've mentioned this before, they'll say, well, I'm only going to study on my own. I'm not going to listen to any man, but they're going to be preaching what they believe on the Internet and that you have to listen to them. Right. So either you believe that we no, don't communicate with anyone at all and we just study the Bible for ourselves. Right. So that's that's what you would have to believe. Or there is a point of you know, reading uh, other people's experience, sharing with other people, studying together. Uh, but there is a part that we only can do. That is, obviously, if, if we just read books and we never actually sit down and prayerfully study and work through things on our own, because there is a personal walk that we have with God, if we never do that, we'll never come to a knowledge of the truth. So I, I'm not really sure I follow what he's trying to get at, other than we know that, you know, people shouldn't take the place of our own personal study. We can agree with that, but it doesn't really follow from what he said. So he said it's a non sequitur. Right. Now, the next step was that he then goes to quote Judges 7, verses 4 to 7. And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people are yet too many. Bring them down unto the water, and I will try them for thee there. And it shall be that of whom I say unto thee, This shall go with thee, the same shall go with thee. And whomsoever I say unto thee, This shall not go with thee, the same shall not go. So he brought down the people unto the water. And the Lord said unto Gideon, Every one that lappeth of the water with his tongue, as a dog lappeth, him shalt thou set by himself. Likewise, every one that boweth down upon his knees to drink. And the number of them that lapped, putting their hand to their mouth, were three hundred men. But the rest of the people bowed down upon their knees to drink water. And the Lord said unto Gideon, By the three hundred men that lappeth, I will say, will I save you? And deliver the Midianites into thine hand, and let all the other people go, every man unto his place. In the account of Gideon and his men, found in Judges 7, the Bible clearly details a two-step testing process. The first three verses show a rather simple method that produces two classes of men. The army, composed of 32,000 men, are given the freedom to choose whether or not they will go out and fight. Realizing that they are up against an immense force, 22,000 men decide to go home and forego the fight. It is interesting to note that it was God himself who decided that there were too many men in Israel's army, as he didn't want them to go out and somehow think that they were capable of defeating such a large and hostile army on their own. Now they are down to 10,000 men, and God still insists that there are too many men for him to work with. So he directs them to another test that will reduce their numbers even more. This time, however, God personally sets the rules of the test. He orders Gideon to bring the men down to the water for the purpose of getting a drink 
before they engage in battle. There each man drinks, the majority of men kneeling down and putting their face in the water, whereas a few dip their hand in the water and put it into their mouth, all the time keeping their eyes open for the enemy. All of these men drink out of the same water, but it's how they each drink that determined whether or not they would go on to fight the battle. In other words, God was looking to see what method each person would use to get the water out of the stream and into their bodies. The water could do them no good as long as it stayed in the stream, but it must somehow be withdrawn and be placed in their mouths and absorbed before it could be of any benefit to them. Why did it even matter to God how they drank, just so long as they drank? Wasn't that good enough? Now, the, the position that he's taking here seems a bit odd. Mm -hmm. first in recounting all of this he jumps to a portion of this of this passage after the 22,000 are sent home right so you have you have different groups so you have you know the first group that just really not interested <laughs> any excuse that they could have they could just go so he just wants people that, that want to be there, right? Okay. So the 10,000 left. And then you're going to have the water, right, drinking in, in the water. But, but what is his point? Like, I'm not sure, how, like, because we've looked at this. Ellen White comments on this, and there isn't any sort of idea in the spirit of prophecy like this regarding this story. Like, he's he's going to try to apply it to methodology. Right. Right, that's what he's he's going to do. So, you know, it's interesting to me how this is not being approached from a symbolic representation. It's so much that that he seems to be looking at this literally. Well, yeah. and trying to apply it so literally. Well, well, what he does is he, you know, so I've looked at his, his material. He, he lot, lots of times argues from analogy. That is where there's something in the story, but he adds things to the story that aren't really part of the story. I mean, obviously they drink from the water, but to him, it's about the water itself not really about the person's attitude. Because in the story, it's not about the water. The water is not really the issue. Correct. Right. right. You know, um, where he's he's taking the water as representing this source material, which I, I've never looked at the story and thought about it in that sense. But, you know, I mean, maybe, maybe you could. But what really here, what was... Uh, you know, what she talks about, like they're keeping their eyes open for the enemy. There's ones that are alert and there's other ones that are, are careless is the way that I would look at it. So that part he puts there, but he doesn't, he doesn't actually draw anything from it. Right. So he's, well, he's saying how they drank, but I don't think this has to do with methodology. I don't know. I'm just. Well, as he, as he proceeds, by now we should be able to see that the water is a type of the word of God, the Bible. Right, which I wouldn't have drawn from this story. Okay. Right. I mean, water can be, you know, used, I guess, in a sense, in that way in certain situations. But in this story, I don't think that that's what I would draw from it. So it's something I, I you know, in our discussion, we never looked at it that way. But we do have, you know, we do have in this story Gideon's 300. So that goes back to the 300 foxes as well. Right. Which he doesn't seem to clearly make that connection. It's sort of like just, you know, maybe tacitly, but because you have the 300 Miller, Millerite charts, which he connects with the 300 foxes. And here you're going to have Gideon's 300. But he, you know, he could have started out you know, drawing from what was before saying, here we have this 300 in the story of, of Samson, you know, these 300 foxes. Now, again, we have this 300, Gideon's 300, and and, and draw it, draw through it that way and connect it, and then connect it to the chart. So you could argue, well, the 300 men, 
represent these truths that are on the 1843 chart, right? And then you could make that argument. And so, so it's not so much in the story. It's not so much about the people. It would be about the truths. Does that sort of make sense? Right. Right. People are connected to those truths because you have the three, you know, Millerite preachers that have the charts and so forth. So it is about a proclamation of a message. But here he's he's addressing it you know, differently again. So, you know, he could have done that. And then it wouldn't be so much about methodology or at least about the individual. So about making it personal. So I, I don't know. It's it's a little bit of a mess, you know, the way that he's put this together. But But it's something to think about. Because right. I don't think we quite looked at it, you know, as the 300, you know, we, we connected the 300 to the 300 charts or to that symbol. But but I think there is a way in which we can understand that this is about the message. The way that we applied it is we applied it to the message of July 18, 2020 in our history. But we could take this whole story and apply it to Millerite history. Which, of course, is the pattern that we're basing our line upon. Well, this next paragraph, we should also realize that it is just as important to us as it was to them in this matter of how to drink, or in our case, of how to study. With both classes of men, it was essential that they have the strengthening, refreshing, vitalizing water before they could go on to the battle. But the fact remains that one group went on to fight and the other was sent home all because of the method they each use to get a drink out of the same body of water. Well, this is ignoring the first group. Now, mm -hmm. didn't we make the application that these three groups, not just two, but these three groups could also be representative of the first, second, and third angel's message? Yeah. Yeah. So in, in and Millerite history, of course, Right. Uh, right. So so you'd have this group that um, because Protestants are going to be tested by the first message. Right. Right. So now some some of them are going to uh, accept the message for a while. But right. That is, they're going to come with the call. But then they're just going to be sent home because they don't really want to participate. And that would be the first angel's message. Make them. So that's one way we could look at it. Then the, the, the next group is the Millerites that are going to be tested. And they're going to be tested upon the truths on uh, the 1843 charts, right? Right. So, so that's the 300. And then you have those then that remain. Those are the ones that accept you know, Habakkuk's two tables, that there was a mistake. They go through the tearing time. That's going to be the second angel's message. So that group is tested, right? So there's two tests if you look at it clearly, right? So that's the first and second angel's message. And then it's going to be uh, how would we get the third angel's message in there? Because there's three groups, but there's really two tests. So you have the one group that comes out of that second test, I guess, would be the Seventh-day Adventists. Okay. Right. Is is that a way of looking at it? The 300. And then, of course, there's the the Sunday law. Right. That's going to be where they um, battle against uh, Midian. OK. So it's not, it's not so much the three group groups are each of the three angels messages, but they're divided by the first two messages. And then it's going to be under the third angels message that you have the Sunday law. Okay. But but we made a, a, an application of that to our history, right? So, but that's just because we're paralleling Millerite history, but we would have to understand it first as applying to Millerite history. But the idea here that this would, that the, the water is a type of the word of God here. So again, you know, he talks about Miller's rules. Is the water a type of the word of God? I mean, when we look at the water, I mean, we know water can represent people, multitude, nations, and tongues, right? 
Right. But when Christ applies it, he applies it more to the water of salvation. Right. Uh, to the gospel itself. Right. And, you know, he, he, you know, they that thirst has come to the water and drink. Right. That that tends to be the way that water is used. It's it's salvation. It's this uh, just like, you know, bread is the word of God, but water is more uh, salvation itself rather than the Bible. I don't know. I don't know if you could you could use Miller's rules to show that the word of God is or is typified by water you know, in that direct way that he's trying to to use here. Obviously, indirectly, because water comes from, I mean, salvation comes from God's word. Does that make sense? I think it makes a good point. Now, if you are familiar with our past, just before the Adventist church was formed, you will recall that there was something different between the Millerites and the rest of the churches of their day. The difference was primarily in the way that they each studied the Bible. It was because of the way in which our pioneers studied that we as Adventists now have a firm platform of truth to stand upon. That platform of truth was given to us as a direct result of the establishment of a method of Bible study. This platform is composed of truths such as the three angels' messages, the investigative judgment, the 2300 years, and even controverted points such as the daily and the 2520 prophecy. Each prophecy or doctrine that is unique to us was arrived at by a careful study of the Bible using a specific method of study. This method of study called Miller's Rules did not employ the use of Greek and Hebrew or depend on a historical grammatical system or a system based on higher criticism but relied instead on the principles contained in Isaiah 28, where it details the concept of line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little. Miller's rules of interpretations are simply an expansion of these principles put into a form that we can understand and utilize. They are the way that God has given us that enables us to come to a correct understanding of the truths contained in the Bible. Remembering that both the oil and the wheat must be put into a usable form before we can expect a good loaf of bread. The oil, a symbol of the Holy Spirit, helps us to correctly understand through a specific method by which to grind the wheat. Put in a different way, these rules are the way that God has chosen to let the Bible speak for itself. No dead language is chained to a desk that the common people cannot understand. No interpreters, no commentators, just 14 rules that anyone can apply. Now, comment from the chat. John 7, 37 to 39, Christ spoke of the water as being the spirit of God. Now, from what, what Glenn is covering here, He's basically trying to say no dead languages chained to a desk. Now he wants to quote from the Review and Herald, November 25th of 1884. Those who are engaged in proclaiming the third angel's message are searching the scriptures upon the same plan that Father Miller adopted. In the little book entitled Views of the Prophecies and Prophetic Phrenology, Father Miller gives the following simple but intelligent and important rules for Bible study and interpretation. Now, okay. Okay, go on. When, when you're going to give a reference like this and then not expand to show what these rules are, I have to wonder why you're even using the quote to begin with. Well, okay. So, so he's, he talks about Miller's rules. Right. I don't think he 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 represents exactly what they are. Right. Okay. Now he he seems to imply that that those rules mean no commentators at all, no interpretation from anyone else. So what was it? Uh, I just got to look at that. Right. So he's going to say. No interpreters, no commentators, no dead languages chained to a desk. 
that the common people cannot understand. So, I mean, he's saying that we shouldn't look at Hebrew and Greek at all. Well, that that would be his implication. But I mean, I, I find it sad because in this example, he's actually mixing a couple of examples. Because at no time do I find that the Hebrew or Greek was chained to a desk. I do find that a Bible yeah. at that point written in Latin was chained to a desk. Which Latin was a dead language that nobody really understood except some educated people. Correct. Um, uh, and it was a dead language. But um, now the Bible was written in Hebrew and Greek. Obviously, I find value in looking at the original Hebrew and Greek. And we have tools that can help us to do that so that we're not dependent just on translations. Now, you know, I mean, he makes comments about all the different translations and, and that they create confusion, which which I agree. One of the things I really dislike, because when I became a Seventh-day Adventist, I grew up with the Revised Standard Version because, you know, I was in the United Church of Canada. So lots of times when I, I had a Bible verse that I wanted to find in my Strong's Concordance, which was based on the King James, I couldn't find it because I had a different word, right, like that I was looking up than was in the King James. And then, of course, you know, people started using the NIV and our scholars all support the new translations. Uh, then the new King James came out, which, you know, it's not a good translation. Uh, there's lots of problems with it. Uh, but, uh, you know, that just creates more confusion, right? And so then you start people seeing people using the new King James, which it's, it's really one of the the worst translations out of, of the ones that people use. NIV is the worst, but uh, anyway, just it does create confusion. But in personal Bible study, to use Cruden's concordance was the way that Miller was able to compare the words of Scripture without knowing the Hebrew and the Greek, right? Okay. Right? I mean, he, he doesn't have the Hebrew and Greek, but he does have a concordance. Correct. And now he's going to then, you know, apply that, which when you use like the tools that we have with eSword, we can actually compare not just the, the translation English word, but we can also compare uh, the Hebrew and Greek words, right? We don't really need to know Hebrew or Greek to at least do a search of the scriptures using a particular word. Right. So you can look up Mara and Ra and Kazon. If we if we didn't have uh Esword or some way of, of doing that, like we couldn't do that with with Crudens, right? Because you, you can just look up the word vision, but you can't tell which Hebrew word it's translated from. So if you're going to take that position. There's lots of things that we could not study and that we couldn't draw conclusions from that we have done. You know, we couldn't look up Sir and Room in Daniel 8 and, and Daniel 11 verse, you know, 31 and 12 verse 11. So is he arguing against doing that? He would seem to be. Okay. So anyway, he's not really clear. Now, the other thing that, of course, is, you know, Miller did study on his own, right? He didn't Correct. use a bunch of commentaries to, uh, you know, to figure things out. But he had to have an understanding of history, right? That is, he had to have some knowledge about, you know, events in history. Not everything that he, and he had to have, have dates in order to deal with the prophetic periods, Right. 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 To, like to get 677, you're not going to get that from just studying your Bible. The, you know, the Bible's no, you could say, well, he had a Bible with Usher's dates in it. But but that's in a sense a commentary. Right. Right. But here's you know, here's one of the one of the points that 
I find interesting when when the comment is being made about the dead languages, there are definitely specific words where in crudence concordance they yeah. give reference to both the Greek and the Hebrew. Okay. So now it's it, it's kind of a problem to say that Cruden did not use and did not present any Greek or Hebrew when it's in the in the concordance itself that he did. Oh, okay. Yeah, I do have a Cruden's, but I haven't really used it because I got Esword, you know, so I um I've looked through it. So is he going to group the words based on the the Hebrew? Like, if you look up vision, is he going to have them grouped as, you know, the ones that are Kazon and Mara and No. Mara? No. Vision is grouped. You've got vision in a vision or visions plural. He does not delineate between the three words. Yeah. Okay. Right, so there are limitations that that Miller had that God still used, but when we look at Miller's rules, it really isn't about um, what he's saying here: no interpreters, no commentators. Right. I mean, Miller is 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 laying down how that we understand how we understand the Bible, how we compare Scripture with Scripture, uh, because his approach was. To understand what he was reading, he started at the beginning, and then when he didn't understand, he would find other places in the scripture that would help explain what he was reading, right? Right. And then he came to understand it, that there were things that were symbolic, um, that we understand the Bible as literally a story, of a narrative that's true, that it's not just some myth, and that there are things that are to be understood as symbols, but it's going to be clear that they're symbols because they can't exist as real, right? You know, the beast with seven heads and ten horns. Um, you know, we're going to understand those things to be symbols. Lots of things that we're going to see throughout the scriptures that are symbols, that are stories, parables, and so forth. He's also going to understand to some degree type typology. Now, we do have an expansion of Miller's rules that, that actually come from the use of Miller's rules, right? That is, there's, there's Miller's 14 rules, but we, we've applied the symbolic use of numbers. Correct. And, and that's not an addition to Miller's rules. It's actually addressing the idea of symbols, that numbers are symbolic. And then we, 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 so we can expand that or delineate it or detail it that, you know, every word of scripture has its bearing, right? That's another rule of Miller's. So some people would, um, you know, criticize how we study. That is, they would say, well, you know, you're looking at Strong's numbers, you're looking at dates as symbols, you know, that's all numerology. But the, the way that we approach it is that the plain reading of scripture is never contradicted by any of these other rules, right? That is, if we find something's a symbol, we can't just apply it willy-nilly. It has to be in accordance with the plain reading of Scripture and of prophecy. And, you know, so when we, when we apply the numbers, it's often as, you know, a secondary or a tertiary or a quaternary uh, line of evidence. It's not the main argument that we're making, and it never contradicts what we read in the scriptures in a plain way, right? That's, right. That's basically, so So he hasn't really presented Miller's rules, and in a sense, he's, he's presented a distortion of Miller's rules. No interpreters, no commentators. So, if because if, because other people can study the Bible, and if we're saying that well, we can never listen to what anyone else says about the Bible, right? Like, because in a sense, we're commentators, just like, you know, the commentators who write commentaries. We're interpreters, right? Because we go through and we study and we interpret the scriptures and we share. Now, you have the opportunity to examine 
and study with us, right? And, and I use commentaries because often the commentaries will help connect some of the different scriptures together, right? They will they'll give some information and they'll say, well, you know, this verse here, it relates to this other verse. So I, I don't have a problem with commentaries except when people depend upon a commentary as their main source and usually a conclusion or an opinion in a commentary as, well, it must be evidently true because this commentator says this is the case, as Uriah Smith does all the time, right? Like I can look at a commentator, but I can't take him as an authority. Like I can't take his interpretation over what the scriptures say. Okay. It throws me why to give a reference to something and then not show what the reference is and explain what you're what you're dealing with mm -hmm. so and, and and misrepresenting it really right now he continues in a, in a totally different path the many different methods of study along with the numerous versions of the bible bring confusion to the truth rather than clarity all of the modern versions of the bible came into existence after 1850 and most if not all were produced by the Protestant denominations and publishing houses. While we should never be unkind in our critique, we must always remember that these institutions are numbered with those that fell when the door was shut to them in 1844. They experienced a moral fall and have continued falling lower and lower. Great Controversy 389.2 their methods and versions will not produce a movement to call us out of Babylon. Rather, it was and will be the other way around. Now, it intrigues me because his comment about all of the modern versions of the Bible coming to existence after 1850. I believe it was in 1826 that the British and American Foreign Bible Society made the decision to remove the Apocrypha from any of their Bibles. I am aware for a fact that the Bible that my friend is using does not have any of the Apocrypha in it. Now, all of these situations, including those where people have a Bible published with Ellen White study guides would be an example of what he's trying to say here about a, a group publishing a Bible that has experienced a moral fall. Should this also be something for our consideration? Okay. Well, so, I mean, to say all modern versions of the Bible came into existence in modern times, it's kind of, it, it it doesn't really mean anything. Now, right. of course, the idea is that, well, it's after there was a fall. Now, we have lots of translations that existed uh, before the King James and translation, translations that occurred after the King James. Right. Uh, Protestant and Catholic translations. But, yeah, they're definitely after the, the discovery of... Uh, you know, the Sinaiticus and the Vaticanus and the Alexandrian manuscripts, um, which then uh, we had uh, Westcott and Hort, you know, working with the revision of the, the text of scripture um, and their theories that led to uh, some of the monstrous mistakes that we see in these modern translations. Now, uh, just think about a version. Do you know the difference what a version is compared to just a regular translation? Does anybody know? Because we just kind of use that word version. Right. Like we have the King James Version. We have the Revised Standard Version. These are versions. Um, now, the NIV is actually should not be called a version. And why is that? Isn't that more of a paraphrase? Yeah, it's a paraphrase, right? 
So, right. so how they managed to get it to be called the New International Version when it's a paraphrase, it's a different type of translation. So versions are meant to be more literal in their translation. That is, you should, with a version, you should be able to translate it back into the original Hebrew or Greek. Uh, but with a paraphrase, you know, it's it's not so direct. And so when you have like the Latin Vulgate, that's a version, right? Or the Septuagint, that's a version. Or the King James, that's a version. But um, so a lot of the translations don't use that term version as part of their title, right? You know, the American Standard Version, that would be a version. But, you know, something like the Bible in basic English, that's not going to be a version, you know, or... The Good things. News Bible would not be a version, it would be a paraphrase. Right, yeah. So so there are different types of translations that can be um, used in study, just like you would use the King James, where you could have a concordance and you could compare the words of scripture with each other. But the King James is the best one to do that, right? So, I mean, I wouldn't use any other translation as a personal uh, study Bible. A lot of people make a big deal about like the American, uh, what is it? Uh, New American Standard Version. New American Standard, which, you know, people say this is such a great translation and it, I don't find it to be a very good translation, but, you know, I've spent a lot of time. I collected a lot of Bibles and did a lot of research on Bible translations uh, through the years. I would say, actually, uh, the English Standard Version is is a better translation than the New American Standard Version. But anyway. I, I was a bit surprised when I looked up the the different Bibles that are drawn primarily from the Textus Receptus. Mm -hmm. So Yeah, and that's gonna that's gonna affect the New Testament. Right. Not really gonna affect the Old Testament. Uh, but there are translations that depend a lot on the Septuagint as far right. as interpreting the Hebrew. And and you know NIV would be one of them. So yeah, you know, obviously we should use the King James, but I do think we need to use Strong's Concordance and the dictionaries. And, uh, you know, the best is to have eSword. You have different translations that you can compare. But but this is a way of, of looking at, at the actual language, even if you don't know how to speak Hebrew or Greek or read Hebrew or Greek. But yeah, sometimes people can come to quite wrong conclusions when they look at the Hebrew or Greek as well. So, so anyway, I, you know, I don't think we should depend upon, you know, tra other translations. So I would agree with him in that sense. Okay. But it's just, it's, I mean, it's obviously uh, an interest of mine, Bible translations. Okay. In considering this, it is highly interesting to understand just how the Midianites and the Amalekites were destroyed. So we're segueing to another subject altogether that he's attempting to make use of as an example. The Bible tells us that the Lord set every man's sword against his fellow. As with the water, John 4, 1 to 15, so the sword also represents the word of God. Ephesians 6, 17. It is these two precise things, the Protestant methods of study, the historical grammatical and the higher critical reasoning, coupled with the different versions of the Bible, which led to their original and continued rejection of the three angels' messages. As a result, they have many conflicting swords of interpretation in the various denominations that will be responsible for the loss of many souls. The point to make is that somehow we as Adventists think that we can incorporate these into our study of Daniel 11, or any prophecy for that matter, and somehow escape from the sure results. The situation that was occurring in 1844, the majority of those that were studying Protestant, Adventist, Millerite, whatever, 
were all using the King James Version. Unless you were Catholic and then you were using the Douay Reims. So I'm having a I, I'm having a bit of an issue with the way this paragraph is presented. Okay, so one is he, he gives us this reference now where water represents the word of God, John 4, verse 1 to 15, which I don't get from that uh, passage dealing with the woman at the well in Samaria, the Samaritan woman at the well, because what Jesus is offering her is, is salvation through him, right? Right. It's, 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 he's not using the water there to represent the scriptures, at least I've never read it that way. Now, we do know a sword represents the word of God. So that's pretty clear. Now, then he's going to mention the historical, grammatical, and higher critical uh, method. So there's the historical, grammatical method, which is what our scholars say they're using. And then there's the critical, grammatical, or historical, critical method, I think it's called, um, that uh, is what many scholars use. So Adventists have, have adopted this name historical grammatical method. And, and these are obviously not Miller's rules. So part of the historical grammatical method is that we should understand the, the scriptures the way that people understood them who were contemporary with their writing and that we generally just take the scriptures more as uh, devotional beyond that, right? So, which is not a method that Miller used. Right. And uh, you see this with this guy, what's his name? Um, Pippin? Is that how you say it? Samuel Pippin? Yeah, he wrote a book on interpreting the scriptures, on hermeneutics. Right. Which is... Uh, as far as I'm concerned, a mockery of how to study the Bible. It's If we're going to study with that method, we're not going to learn anything. The Bible just becomes devotional, and, and, and the doctrines actually come from the church, right? So, so like the Catholics basically chained the scriptures initially, but they weakened the scriptures by making one is the church the interpreter of the scriptures, but with it, within Adventism, we have the same thing. We have the doctrines of the church that can't be controverted, right? You can't disagree with what the church church's doctrines are. You can't use the Bible to test those doctrines because they've been established by the church. You can only study the Bible uh, devotionally. And if you're going to, you know, read the stories of, let's say, Judges, you could learn lessons, moral lessons from the stories of judges, but you definitely couldn't apply it as, you know, that it was written as in, in samples or types of the present, right? You, you can't, as an Adventist, read the book of Judges and make a parallel to the history that we're living in right now, right? Correct. Yeah. So, so there are things that we do in how we study that are basically forbidden, right? So we can't we can't use the symbolic use of numbers. We can't we can't apply history as in typology, even though Ellen White does it all the time. And um, you know we can't we can't have any sort of hidden meaning in the scriptures, right? So we can't we can't apply we can't really use the scriptures other than devotional material. And that, that's what the historical grammatical method does to the scriptures. The historical critical method just deals with the scriptures as if they're a uh, myth, right? So, so obviously we're not going to use those methods of Bible study. Correct. Now, Gideon and his men came against the Midianites with a trumpet in their right hand and lamps in their left hands. In other words, through the lens of the type, the Millerites came with a correct interpretation of Bible prophecy that was arrived at by the correct method of study, utilizing the correct version, King James Version of the Bible, thus giving the trumpet a certain sound. The vessels were broken, allowing the lamps, the Bible, to shine without human speculation. 
And the quote here is, of all the great religious movements since the days of the apostles, none have been more free from human imperfection and the wiles of Satan than that of the autumn of 1844. Great Controversy 401.3. Christ always demonstrates the end from the beginning, and it will yet be seen in the study of Daniel 11:31 to 45 that if we employ the same principles in our study, we will also arrive at, at the correct conclusion. Those who do this must also contend with the popular misconceptions and long-standing errors held in our church. Now, in the first article, he made it very clear that he was not here to be critical or criticize. Yet, in this statement, He's commenting about contending with popular misconceptions and long-standing errors. Is that not criticism? Well, maybe he's not criticizing individuals per se, but okay. I mean, obviously, there, there is there needs to be criticism, right? I mean, as far as errors, because you know, if if he's not correcting any errors, then there's no almost, you know, that. That's, I mean, that's the purpose of his his study is to show, you know, how we should correctly study. And uh, but I don't think he's doing a good job of showing how we should correctly study. Right. But even if he even if he himself is correctly studying, he, he's not demonstrating how to do that. OK. So. Um, OK, so there was here. um so when we looked at this story of, of the trumpets and the lamps, right? So we know that this is a specific message. If we're applying this to Millerite history, we know that that, that trumpet is uh, the messages of the first, second, first and second angels' messages, right? Right. Um, and we would place this story, if we're going to, if we're going to take the story of Gideon and we put it into to Millerite history, we would then have to say that, well, Gideon is actually going beyond Millerite history because the third angel's message arrives on October 22nd, 1844. But the trumpet must refer to the proclamation of, of the Sabbath and, and the truths after 1844, right? Because if we're saying the first angel's messages uh, and the second angel's messages are those messages that cause that division, to then we finally have the Seventh Day Adventist Church that is supposed to be giving that message, which is the Sunday Law, right? We would understand that that message is the Sunday Law, right? About the mark of the beast and so forth, the Third Angel's message. Okay. Even if we apply this to the Millerite history, it you can't put this as the Second Angel's message in Millerite history. Right, because you can see how he's taking the story. He's just saying it applies to the Millerites. Right. But we would have to say it applies to Seventh-day Adventists. Agreed. Yeah, okay. And so now we know the vessels being broken. What is What does that represent? Isn't that more shining light? Well, we have this treasure in earth and vessels, right? Okay. So this would be Christ's character perfectly reproduced in his people. That is, we would have people who they are broken, right? Okay. Right, right. They self is not in the way of giving, letting this light shine. So this has to do with more perfection of character, right? So he doesn't really address what the vessels being broken represents. He just says the vessels were broken, allowing the lamps, which, I mean, God's word is a lamp, right? So we, we can definitely say, well, that's the scriptures to shine without human speculation. So you could say, well, the breaking of those vessels is the breaking of human speculation or something. But we would see it as 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 a conversion process. You, you have a convert converted people Proclaiming the truths of scripture with a trumpet, which is that message in the last days dealing with the third angel's message. So to take this quote from Great Controversy and apply it to the story of Gideon 
we don't put the story of Gideon in Millerite history in that way. No. Yeah. Okay. As we have seen, Gideon's men all drank out of the same water. But it was how they drank that counted. Considering the context of these articles, it is interesting to note that it was the class of men who drank deeply of the water who were sent home. These represent those who are stuck in the endless minutia of the process itself. Uh, okay. Comment? Well, is that really what was that they drank deeply of the water who were sent home? No. No, I mean, they, they put their mouths down to the water, but that's not really the issue of how much water they drank. Right? This, is, this is leaping to a conclusion. Yeah. Stuck in the endless minutia of the process itself. So, I mean, so obviously, I don't think we're, we study minutia, okay? That is, the details are important of script, in Scripture. Right. We, we, we handle the word of God carefully. That is, we, we, when you're studying the Bible, you don't just simply, you know, read, read on the surface and, and draw conclusions. You have to compare scripture with scripture. It, it's diligent Bible study. Now, so I'm not sure what he means by stuck in the endless minutia. I mean, we, we definitely aren't going to, argue you know how many angels can dance on the head of a pin type of thing but the minutia of the process itself i'm not sure what that even means is, is that really the problem that people are stuck in the minutia I, I think it's actually quite the opposite problem is that people are not really studying they're not looking how at we they're allowing too many others to tell them what the Bible says rather than searching it for themselves. Now, th this next paragraph is interesting, too. So, In other words, they drank so deeply of the actual methodologies themselves that they, the methodologies, are no longer able to produce truth that is either useful or instructive. They have become bloated as the process has become the end rather than a means to an end. Yeah. So I wonder what, so do you, do you know what he's really referring to? What he's, what he's digging at here? Cause no, I really don't. Okay. Cause is he accusing something within the church? Cause I don't see that in the church. I mean, if he was giving a, uh, a criticism of us, then, then I could see, you know, that, that he could be aiming it at, People like us who who spend so much time studying and and are involved in this process, but I don't think that you could say that the way that we're studying uh, makes somebody bloated. Now, what what makes somebody bloated? Gas, <laughs> Over okay. over overeating and drinking oh. with, or eating with oh. water. Yeah, overeating taking in uh, things that you you can't process, right? So when we study, uh, you know, sometimes maybe we do overeat a little bit. We take on more than we can process, digest. But but the idea that we, we're going through here is that we study God's word and we receive a conviction and, and we act on those convictions, right? You know, so we're not just mindlessly, mind, mindlessly stuffing ourselves with knowledge we're trying to apply that knowledge, right? So that means if, if you take in nutrients, you need to exercise. You need to actually burn those calories, right? You know, related to, uh, you know, if I go backpacking, I can eat, you know, 4,000 calories a day. Uh, but I definitely can't eat 4,000 calories a day if I'm sitting on, on the couch watching television all day long, right? I will become bloated. So I'm not really sure, you know, <laughs> the way he thinks about this. It it's, just seems kind of a, a bit of a mishmash of, of ideas. But, you know, I don't think he's wrong in his, in his intent. At least I haven't seen that so far. But 
I don't know if people actually. What's that, Angela? Oh, sorry. I hate butting in. It's so hard and on Zoom. It says uh, Matthew twenty four thirty eight reminds us as in the days of Noah, before the flood, they were eating and drinking. Well, it's not only devouring too much food as in gluttony, but in absorbing or speculating about all kinds of junk that's floating around these days, which can make us spiritually and mentally bloated. Yeah, because we're supposed to separate the precious from the vile, right? That is, we have to rightly divide the word of truth. We have to understand the scriptures. We have to put them into practice. Like when I look at Miller's, you know, last rule, which I think is 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 a very broad rule. Like there, it, it it involves lots of things that we must have faith, which is more than just trusting God's word in like in an intellectual way, but it's actually acting on God's word. That that is, it includes the conviction that we get from studying God's word, and and everything that we would we would put into what is involved in in the Christian life. Right. So if you're studying the scriptures and it's just an intellectual exercise, then it's not going to benefit you at all. Um, which I think is what I would say, you know, people who are just like studying, but they're not they're not putting it into practice. That's maybe what he could be aiming at or at least trying to address here. But I don't know anybody who just is deeply involved in the actual methodologies themselves and. Right. I, I don't really think it's about methodology. Right. That is in 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 how like a person can study the Bible. If he goes to God and says, Lord, I want to understand the scriptures. Please guide and direct me in understanding the Bible. He doesn't really need to know methodology. Right. In order to come to understand the truth. Correct. Yes, I think so. Yeah, because God can direct him. I mean, when I was, you know, 14 years old and I'm reading the book of Revelation and I pray to God, God, it says that blessed is he that reads these words and understands those things and keeps those things, you know, for the time is at hand. I could pray to God as a 14 year old who doesn't really understand much about methodology or anything. I mean, I've read lots of the Bible and I've read commentaries and so forth, but God could direct me and, and he directed me in, in different ways, right? One is in, in my personal experience of things that happened to me in my life. Um, but also he directed me to the seventh day Adventist church, right? So I ended up becoming a seventh day Adventist you know, like uh, five years later, right? So it's lots of things that happen in my life. So God can answer those prayers. Now, a person can have complete understanding of, you know, methodologies. They may even profess to believe Miller's rules. But if they're not really seeking God, if they're not wanting to address the sins in their own lives, and that it doesn't really matter what methodology they use, right? They're not going to come to an understanding of the truth, right? If they're not going to obey God, if they're not going to receive a conviction as they study God's word, it's not going to benefit them. And, and even if people know the correct methodologies, often they don't, they don't practice what they, what they know, right? Because we're sinners, right? We, we use we use the Bible as a way of avoiding dealing with who we are, and uh, so you know I, I think we can just make too much about methodology. It's uh, it's not the be all and end all in understanding truth. No, it's not. No, if the scripture doesn't jump off the page into our into our own experience for the day, then it's not the living word like yesterday mm -hmm. i just had a quick prayer and opened the bible and some you know sometimes i do that and jumped off the page about a fiery trial the fire uh, a sacrifice offered by fire and boy i'll tell you <laughs> it was a good day it was a yeah. fiery day that was a trial day but it was a sacrifice 
offered to God a sweet savor. Yeah. And, and so and so we can approach the scriptures in different ways in different times. Like there are times that we're we're studying, you know, very intellectually. Like I'm going through and I'm studying like the chronology of the kings of Judah, right? And uh there isn't a lot of things in doing that study directly that are speaking to me at that moment about my personal day-to-day life, right? Mm-hmm. You, that? you know, like, yeah, yeah, I do. You know, but it doesn't mean that that's a waste of my time either, because the conviction that comes is I study God's word and I put the scriptures together and I get a, a better picture. You know, one of the things that happened to me one time when I was studying, like, the whole story of, uh, well, the chronology of the Babylonian captivity and the end of it and so forth. And I'd spent so much time in studying it that I became very familiar with the the people in scriptures and their experiences. And I was reading uh, to Heidi from, uh, I think it was Prophets and Kings, um, and you know, as I was reading, I became very emotional because for the first time in reading that story, because I'd read Prophets and Kings many times, but I'd always kind of read over it. That is, I didn't understand, you know, who these people were and what happened. And now it just meant something to me, right? You know, so so both parts are necessary that that personal deep study of of the details of scripture struggling over difficult passages that may not in and of themselves just you know be the message for the day but but there are times that we just open the scriptures and if we just limited it to you know i'm just going to open the scriptures and read read a a, a chapter each day and that's going to be my bible study those those scriptures may not speak as much to you if if you um, than if you had done all of the other type of study as well, right? So you need both. It's, 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 this it's, yeah, the other one you're both you're referring to is storing the truths of scripture in our in our minds, and then the Holy Spirit at the appropriate time or the right time, the opportune time, brings them to mind and. They're applied in our experience, and that's yeah. that's when we can have the weeping of joy that God is speaking to us mm-hmm. through the, through His Word. Okay, thanks, Kevin. Okay, Dwight, you got this last little bit of this conclusion to finish off. Right, Jacob helps us to see the same thing put in a different way. Jacob's sheep drank out of the same watering trough, just as Gideon's men all drank out of the same water. But this time something is added when a certain class of sheep drink of the water. This is the subject for part six. So I'm baffled because I don't really see this being as fully presented as it could be. And now we're segueing into a different situation altogether where Jacob's sheep are now going to be compared with Gideon's men just because of the use of the water. Yeah, which which I don't think I would do. But this is his part six study on Jacob's sheep. So, right. so we'll get to part six then on Sunday. Any other thought? or comment or question at this point. Okay, shall we then close with prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for the various examples that are contained within scripture. We thank you, Father, for helping us to address things, to consider things, and to learn more about what you would have us to understand. We ask for your blessing today. We ask for your guidance and your direction so that all that we do may bring glory to your name. Help us to this end, for we need you in all things. For this we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen.